All right, so we are working our way through the complement system, and we've already talked about the three initiation pathways, alternative, classical, and lectin. And this just basically gets us to a point where our inactive complement proteins are fragmented up into their active subunits. So once we've, once we have activated the complement system, we're going to have an increase in the number of complement fragments. So an increase in the number of the complement fragments. And what's going to happen as these fragments become present is we're going to get a couple of responses that are going to help out with this immune function. So one of the responses as complement fragments increase is just to have a higher level of blood flow that we refer to as inflammation. Now, alongside that higher level of blood flow, we increase the number of basophils and mast cells. So number of basophils and mast cells that are at the site of injury or near the site of infection. And these two cell types produce a molecule called histamine. In response to this increase in histamine alongside this inflammation, we're also, we're also going to see neutrophils and macrophages increase in activity at this location. Okay, so we have this, immune, uh, this inflammation response that's creating an environment that's going to begin to destroy and mop up these invading pathogens. We're also going to have a process occur called immune clearance. So immune clearance is going to occur. And what's happening here is we're going to have that interaction or we're going to have interactions between antigens located on the debris or on the microorganisms or the virus interacting with antibodies, which are going to be proteins that uh, can bind to antigens. So really this interaction, just to put it in simple terms, we're going to have flags bound up to debris, saying, hey, this needs to be cleaned up. Now, this whole complex that's forming between the antigens and antibodies bound up on the debris is centered around the red blood cell. So we're really collecting up this debris and putting it on a cell that's really mobile in the red blood cell. And it begins to circulate, holding on to this debris. And as it circulates, the debris eventually makes its way into the liver and into the spleen. And then at these two locations, which have phagocytic cells that are present, We're going to have those phagocytes degrade the debris associated with the red blood cell. Okay, so we're clearing out all of that immune debris that's being broken up and chopped up because of the inflammation, and we're moving that out of out of the site of injury or the site of infection to get neutralized by the liver and by the spleen because of the phagocytes that are present in both of those organs. Now, we're also actually going to have some adjustments in phagocytosis, which you'll recognize as one of our endocytotic processes. And phagocytosis is always occurring, but in the presence of complement proteins, it actually is going to enhance. It's actually going to become more prevalent within the organism. So 
So our complement proteins enhance this phagocytic process. Now as this phagocytic process is enhanced, we have phagocytes that attach to foreign cells Okay, so these cells are going to attach to foreign cells. That process is known as opsonization. Opsonization. So opsonization is going to occur. This process is going to act in binding, so we have binding sites. And then, since they are phagocytic cells, we aid in internalization. So, complement proteins grab on, and this is, this is what we're talking about right here. We have complement proteins that grab on or bind to that microorganism, and they act or aid in being basically a docking point so that this opsonized cell can now bind up to or interact with a phagocytic cell and then it gets internalized. If the complement proteins weren't there, we wouldn't have as high of a rate of phagocytosis. So that complement protein is really going to make that process a lot easier to happen, a lot more efficient to occur. Now the last part here uh, that occurs, the last thing that occurs here with the complement protein, once it's activated, we have cytolysis that's going to occur. And hopefully you're recognizing or continuing to recognize, you can parse that word, and that literally means cell breaking or cell breaking apart. So that's what we have going on down here at the bottom. I'm actually, this is important enough to show kind of another picture of what happens here. The fragments as they get activated initiate a cascade, again, that leads towards an increase in the number of complement fragments. Increase in the number of complement fragments. And there's a pathway that occurs for cytolysis, cytolysis specifically. Okay, so C3, that's a complement protein, right? Is it active or inactive? Inactive. Because it doesn't have another letter. So C3. When one of those three pathways is initiated, alternative, classical, or lectin pathway, C3 is going to be one of the 20 complement proteins that goes through an activation process. Deactivation is when we're going to get the fragments. And so we end up with two fragments. We end up with C3A plus C3B. Okay, so C3A and C3B. Now these two fragments are going to cause another, so this is the cascade, right? This is the, the cascade event that occurs. C3 becomes our two active proteins, and then we interact with C5. Another complement protein, active or inactive? Inactive. C5, when it interacts with these fragments, is going to further cause fragmentation. So we get C5A plus we get C5B. Okay, so now we have basically four different complement proteins that are active. I'm going to kind of work my way back up this way. C5B is going to be, in its active form, able to bind to C6, 
C7, and C8. Okay, so now we have, and we could write it out, all of this happens, we have the binding of C6, 7, and 8 to C5B, and we end up with this protein complex, C5B, 6, 7, 8. Okay, so the C5B, 6, 7, 8 complex forms. All initiated by that C3 cascade. Not quite yet. This is a sort of a starting product, so to speak, created by this phosph or this um, complement protein cascade. Yeah, so we start with C3. C3 is just circulating, then you get an infection, and we either al uh, activate alternate, alternate classical or lectin pathway. And that activation causes fragmentation of C3 into C3A and C3B. As C C3B protein numbers increase in circulation, we begin to interact more frequently with C5. C5 undergoes this fragmentation process to generate C5A and C5B. C5B levels begin to increase and they interact with C6, 7, and 8. These are three other complement proteins that are just circulating. So they interact and they form this big protein complex, C5B, 6, 7, 8. Four proteins in the complex. Other than just meaning that it's active, what does that mean? Well, because the protein, so let me just kind of, this is going to be a terrible representation, but this is C3 for all practical purposes. C3, when it's in its inactive form, has two different parts. Here's one of the parts, and then here's the other part. So this is one part, and this is the other part. When it's active, these two parts separate. And so we end up with the little piece, and then we end up with the bigger piece. This is A, this is B. So in each one, there can only be two options. No, not necessarily. Um, so it's just different. It, yeah, it just it depends on, and, and it's a lot like um, hemoglobin, right? Hemoglobin have four different subunits, two alpha units and two beta units. So uh, this is very, very common in the protein world to have basically individual polypeptides that come together, or even parts of a whole poly polypeptide that get cleaved at a certain bond. So like, if you were to write what the C5B bound to, it would be 6B, 6, I mean, C6B, B, C7, like that, or would you write it like that? So the, these here, C6, 7, and 8, really mm -hmm. don't go through a fragmentation process. They're circulating inactively, they are activated when they bind C5B. Because remember what happens when we bind a protein with something. We change the shape and we change the function of that protein. So we're taking C5B, which has been split apart as an enzymatic reaction. It's now changed its shape and changed its function. The change in shape and function result in being able to bind to C6, C7, C8 to form this whole complex. And now we have a, the, the proteins are still there, but they're associated in a new way, which gives them a new function. Okay, so C5, B6, 7, and 8. The protein complex is formed, and then once in this form, this form of protein now has the ability to bind many individual C9 proteins. Okay, so here's yet another complement protein, C9. Now, C C9 on its own may look something sort of like that. It's just basically looks kind of like a wall, just a a piece of a wall. When we begin to add many C9s and activate them because of the presence of C5B6, 7, and 8, those C9 proteins, they begin to form a ring structure. 
and we might even call this a pore. Okay, so we're beginning to form a, a pore. And that's what you're looking at over here in this picture. These would be the individual C9 proteins. You can't really see C5, C5, B6, 7, 8 represented. But we begin to form this ring. And that ring centered around C9 is going to insert into a foreign cell's membrane. Okay, so we insert into a foreign cell's membrane. And this pore, it's a good size pore relative to the whole, the whole invading cell. And so once it's in that cell, we refer to it as a membrane attack complex. And this membrane attack complex creates a giant hole in that membrane. And this giant hole is big enough to allow a significant amount of leakage of ions in water. Basically, a significant amount of leakage of intracellular fluid and extracellular fluid. And water and ions begin to rush out of the cell, causing a rapid decrease in the cell's size. And it ruptures through a process known as plasmolysis. So the loss of the cytoplasm leads to breakage of the cell, a rupture of the membrane. and then. We're no longer an effective cell anymore. It's like science fiction. Is everybody good on this? It's pretty crazy. So there are 20 complement proteins. They're always circulating. We could go and we could try to pull some blood out and we could try to measure the complement protein and we're going to find them. We're not necessarily going to find the fragments. The fragments begin to really increase in number after activation of the complement system through those three different pathways, alternative, classical, or lectin pathway, which is propagated by the presence of microorganisms or viruses. I mean, pathogen. Okay, so first line of defense is going to be barriers that deter entry, skin and mucous membranes. The second line of defense is going to be nonspecific responses and includes things like the interferons and the complement proteins. What if all of this fails? What if we can't deter entry and what if our nonspecific our non-specific second line of defense isn't cut. Fortunately, we have one more option. It's called the third line of defense. No, not dense. Defense. Okay, so the third line of defense. The third line of defense is called specific immunity. So specific immunity. And it's really what comprises the immune system. So everything up to this point has just been lymphatic specific. Now we're into the immune system. So you're beginning to see why those terms are not interchangeable. The immune system is just one portion of the lymphatic system here as the third line of defense. Now the third line of defense has two characteristics. And those two characteristics are specificity. which means the immune response that occurs 
the immune response that occurs is specific to one particular pathogen. The other characteristic is a characteristic that is known as memory. So specificity, the idea that we're going to have a very specific response for a specific pathogen, and then memory. And memory is really interesting because an initial exposure to a pathogen, first time in your life that you interact with a specific cold virus, you most likely are going to get a cold. And you're going to not be able to deter entry. The second line of defense is going to fail and not be able to take care of the virus. And then we'll mount a, an immune response that leads towards this, me uh, this memory. So the first exposure leads to a quicker response the second time that you're exposed. Or I can even say quicker responses in subsequent times. The response happens quick enough that most of the time illness is not usually noticed. And this is, in fact, the, the whole... Um, physiological reason that vaccines can work. We can get the flu vaccine in August or September to protect us, so that's our first exposure. And the way that we get exposed is we're using a very um, either dead organism or a very, very weak uh, virus, I should say, to give us that first initial exposure to create the memory. And then the second time we get exposed, if we run into that virus that causes the influ influenza or to causes the flu that year, we've already got the, the memory in place and we can have a very quick response and we're able to usually fight that virus off before it causes any sort of illness. Now, one of the questions that I think would be really reasonable to ask is, well, then how can we ever get sick after, you know, 25 years of constantly being exposed to pathogens. Well, because there's literally millions and millions of different pathogens, and they are constantly changing or mutating. The flu virus, we kind of have an idea what the flu, flu, flu virus is going to look like from year to year before the flu season, but you always have to get a new vaccine. And the reason you're always having to get a new vaccine, we don't just vaccinate once against the influenza virus, but we uh, vaccinate every year because that influenza virus is always changing, and it's a different strain. You'll remember that a couple of years ago, one of the big influenza viruses was H1N1, and everybody was afraid of H1N1 because it was mutating so quickly. We've already had, uh, we, I think one of them uh, uh, in the last couple of years has been, what was H5N2, a different virus that is now present in, in our environment. So there's constantly new viruses that are coming about and new bacteria and other things that you're running into. So this immunity that we have is going to be present at two different levels. And the two levels are specifically known as cell-mediated immunity, which just like its name suggests, this is going to be at the level of the cell. So we're going to have a specific immune response that's occurring cellularly. The second is humoral immunity. In humoral immunity, humor is another way to say body fluid. Mediated. Yeah, mediated. So cell mediated and then humoral, uh, humoral immunity. immunity. Humor, humor is the body fluid. And one of the things that 
we're really good at doing with things like plasma and other body fluids is generating antibodies. In fact, we're so good at doing this that the whole process of biotechnology producing antibodies for research and other activities outside of normal immune function, we raise rabbits or goats or horses or cows and we give them a an injection of a specific protein that is not supposed to be there and they generate a bunch of antibodies against that protein because of the natural immune system and then we just pull their plasma off to be purified. Okay, so those two different levels, we're going to start out with the cellular immunity. Okay, so cellular immunity. So we got a couple different types of cellular immunity. We have a response that's centered around the T lymphocytes. And by the way, just to give you a kind of preemptive, uh, preemptive look here. Number four is going to be humoral immunity, and that's going to probably be about 35, 40 minutes away. So the, the next, the rest of today's lecture is going to just deal with cellular immunity and what's going on at the level of the cell. Just so you're aware, everything else is coming under cellular immunity. We'll get to humoral immunity, maybe 40 minutes lecture time. <laughs> Just want to give you a little preempting there. All right, so cellular immunity is in part centered around the T lymphocytes. What are the T lymphocytes maturing? Anyone remember? No? Thymus. And these cells in their mature form are really good at attacking invaders. And even your own cells that have become diseased. And so that might be a cell that is cancer causing or cancer carrying, or it could be cells that have been infected with viruses. So we got to get rid of the cells that are also your own that aren't really functioning normally. And T lymphocytes are going to attack those invaders, the invading cells, and also any of the disease cells. And in that process of attacking, they're in part going to generate the memory that we have with our specific immunity. Okay? So we have to talk a little bit about the invasion. We have to talk a little bit about how we generate that memory. So we have four classes of cells that are going to be utilized in this response. The first is known as a cytotoxic T cell. also abbreviate that just as the T substrate C. Okay? These cytotoxic T cells are going to be responsible to actually carry out an attack. So these are kind of like your soldiers in your immune army. Now even though a soldier is a great fighting machine, they get help. They have surveillance and information that's providing them um, or surveillance and, and uh, other individuals helping them to melt this attack effectively. 
immune system also does this. We have helper T cells. We can call those T with the subscript H. So the helper T cells, and they will help in the process or aid in this process of T cell attack. They will help to promote that process or help to promote the efficacy of the attack, make it more efficient. Um, now, what would happen if we had an unrestricted growth of cytotoxic T cells? And we just kept on getting more and more and more cytotoxic T cells. Pretty soon the army would be absolutely huge and it would probably be really unruly. So a third type of cell called a regulatory T or a T subscript R cell is going to help to limit the multiplication of other T cells. So we don't get some gigantic unruly army that we don't really need. Yes? Is that Yeah, so if you have an autoimmune disease, yeah. um, that's a great question. There are a ton of autoimmune diseases, and I don't really know much about it. Um, my guess, uh, if I were to just kind of throw things out there, is you might have regulatory issues, um, or you might have um, some of this process that's occurring more on the humoral immunity side where you begin to tag some of your own cells as being foreign cells and so the natural cellular process to destroy foreign cells occurs but you're killing all of your own cells. But certainly this here, this regulatory C cell uh, or regulatory T cell, this, uh, this would certainly be something that could help to prevent autoimmune dysfunction. All right, the last type of T cell here is a memory T cell. We'll call that a TM cell, TMC. <laughs> and these are going to be the cells that will hold the memory, so to speak, for the immune system. Okay, so there's the players. Four different cells involved, four different cells involved in this process. Okay, so when we're ready to mount an immune response, we have the response occur in three stages. Okay, so there's going to be three steps that are going to occur. The first is we have to actually recognize that we have an invasion, right? So we're going to need to undergo recognition. And the recognition process is going to be centered around those proteins that are found in the invading cells or even lack of proteins that are found. Basically, the immune system has to look at two individual cells, one that's supposed to be there and one that isn't supposed to be there. And they need to be able to recognize, the immune system needs to be able to recognize this cell has the right fingerprint and should be here. This cell doesn't have the right fingerprint. That comes from antigens. So for recognition, we're going to have antigens that are present. When those antigens are present and we have an antigen that shouldn't be there, we, we begin to say, okay, red flag, this cell is not supposed to be here. The first step is to Antigen presenting cell. 
is to basically take that antigen or that signal from the antigen and begin to distribute it to the other parts of the immune system to say, hey, we got an antigen present. It's time that we begin to do something about this. So we're going to start with what's known as an antigen presenting cell. We can call this an APC. And this is a self cell. This is one of your cells. So we generate this antigen presenting cell that is actually going to pick up that antigen from the foreign invading cell. That antigen presenting cell is now basically a cell that's been primed to carry the antigen from the invader. And it's going to take that antigen from the invader and that information car carried in that antigen. So it carries the antigen into the lymph system to a lymph node. Now the lymph node, why are we going to the lymph node? Well, the lymph node, remember, we have the bone and the thymus producing and maturing the, lymph, the lymphocytes. And then those lymphocytes enter the bloodstream in the lymph, and they get collected up in places like the lymph node. So the lymph node, and we're going there because that's where our T cells are present. In the lymph node, this antigen presenting cell carries this antigen and goes, hey, check it out, lymph, or T cell. There's an antigen. It's not supposed to be here. And so we say the T cell in the lymph nodes are going to observe the antigen. Now, in response, this is very vital information. And now the body needs to respond. And the response is to say, all right, we have found at least one invader. Let's go see who else is out there. And so from there, we initiate a patrol. And the T cells will I'm sorry, what was the question? You jumped ahead of me just a little bit, which is really great. Our cytotoxic T cell and our helper T cell are going to go out on patrol and look for the antigen that they expect to be present. Okay? So they start going out, they're working their way through tissues, they're patrolling, looking for antigens. Now we begin to observe antigens that are not attached to antigen presenting cells, but rather are present on the fit foreign invader. So now we're beginning to find these foreign invaders because of the presence of their antigens. What's first going to happen is the antigen is going to be bound up to what's known as a major histocompatibility complex 1, an MHC. I'll go ahead and write that down. Major histocompatibility C complex. And it's just isoform 1 of this particular protein. Okay, so our MHC1, our major histocompatibility complex, isoform 1. This is a protein that's going to get bound onto to hold the antigen. This becomes a kill me signal. Okay, so we first go through this process of recognition, and then we go out and try to find more of these cells, trying to isolate the site of infection. Maybe it's in the eye, maybe it's in, I don't know, the skin somewhere or the lungs. And so now we're going to have a kill me signal that gets generated. And this kill me signal is the first part of the immune response. So the immune response is going to be 
initiated. Okay, still under the process of recognition. By the way, I said that there was going to be three stages. Recognition, attack, and then memory are the three stages. So we're still under recognition. After the immune response is initiated, still part of recognition is to have our T cells activated, T cell activation in mass. Okay. So a lot of stuff going here on, on this slide. This is to detail uh, T cell activation. So we're basically trying to mobilize the army. Now note that we've already put that kill me signal in place. And so we have kill me signals on a variety of different cells. These are the cells we basically have flagged them and said, all right, these are the cells that we need to destroy. With T cell activation, T cells in that location are going to undergo antigen recognition. So antigen recognition is going to occur. And the way that this antigen recognition occurs is for the T cell to bind up to that major histocompatibility complex that's holding the antigen. Okay? Now, fortunately, there's going to be a safeguard here. So we, we, we're creating an interaction between T cells and that major histocompatibility complex that's bound up to the antigen. Now, before we do anything, we're going to double check. going to have a discount double check. Sorry. So we go through our double check, which is centered around a co-stimulation particle. And that co-stimulation particle basically comes in, binds and interacts with the major histocompatibility complex. And if everything is copacetic, and this really is a foreign cell, hopefully we'll have confirmation of that fact. The antigen is not supposed to be here. It is foreign. Okay, so we go through our double check. We really confirm the antigen is supposed to not be here, so it is truly a foreign antigen. That co-stimulation particle and the interaction is going to lead towards programming of the T cell against that antigen. Good. So confirmation of the antigen is foreign, we get T cell programming. So the T cell is going to be programmed against the antigen. Now, once we have programmed the T cell against that specific antigen, we want to have our army built. We want to have all of these cells programmed against this T cell so that they can specifically attack, I'm sorry, not against the T cell, against the antigen and the microbe containing that antigen so we can have a specific attack against the antigens that are present. So this programming leads to a process called colonial selection. In this T cell, it's getting programmed, 
And now it's going to undergo this process where one cell becomes two cells, becomes four cells, and it's always containing the right metabolic makeup to be programmed against the pathogen. So clones of T cells are going to be produced. All of them should be programmed against that antigen. Which ultimately, when I say the antigen, I'm really saying whatever is going to be containing that antigen. So the net result here is to build an army. We built our army. Now we're ready to go make our war. Okay, so the next step now that recognition is complete and we have an army program to kill anything that contains that antigen, we're ready to attack. So we begin our attack process. Your history. So you can see the attack process. No, there's not little guns, but the bacteria may be phagocytized, picked up by the um, by the killer T cell and broken apart and ripped apart. And it could be virus infected cells or bacterium infected cells or the bacterium themselves or the cancer cell. Now this attack process, there's a variety of different weapons that we can use. So a variety of different weapons. The helper T cells can begin to secrete proteins, a class of protein known as an interleukin. Interleukins are frequently referred to just as IL something, some number, so IL6, IL8. These are all examples of different interleukins. These are proteins that can be secreted by the helper T cells. Now remember, the helper T cell is basically the support troop for our cytotoxic T cells. And the interleukins, as they're secreted, are going to exert three effects. And those three effects are the cliffhanger until Monday. Oh, man. So that's when we stop this game.